Coming up, who won that Luke Weaver for Emmanuel Rivera trade? Could this be Toy Lovello's final season? And should the D-backs enter the Otani sweepstakes? Discussing all that next. You are locked on Diamondbacks. Your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day listening to who? Always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, millerthomas 24portfoliocom On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles, from my photos and my graphic design. If if you want to see more content by me, just follow me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for my personal mm-hmm. account, or just look up Locked On Diamondbacks on both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Diamondbacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. I got a whole bunch I want to talk to you guys about today. But I first want to start here and talk about Tori Lovello and potentially could this be his final season? And a quick shout out to my YouTube channel, Locked on Diamondbacks, because I don't want to forget to mention it. Follow us on YouTube, Locked on Diamondbacks. But now let's get into the crux of the podcast because I want to discuss, could this be Tori Lovello's final season? Oh, farewell season for Lovello because Bob Nightingale of USA Today recently came out with an article just detailing some managers that could also be on the hot seat after the Chris Woodward of the Rangers getting fired. And one of those names on Nightingale's hot seat list was Tori Lovello. So I want to ask the question, could this be his final season? And Whether this is Toy Lavelle's final season or not, I think it depends on two questions. How do the D-backs finish the year? And how do the young players look to finish the year? Because the team currently looks pretty good in the second half of the season. I'm recording this at 9 o'clock at night on Tuesday. So the D-backs just beat the Kansas City Royals. So I believe they're now two games above 500 in the second half. So a very good, very strong, very positive half. Very positive second half of baseball for the D-backs is some of it against mediocre competition. Sure, but it's like if we beat the Giants in the series, like I'm not going to just consider that mediocre competition. That was a 100-plus win team last year. So if the D-backs whoop up the Giants, which they've been doing all season, I think that's going to be pretty impressive because it's not like the D-backs um, are world beaters. So when the D-backs beat someone in a series, it's not like they're an elite team themselves. So they can play to anybody's competition. So I do like you when the D-backs beat the teams that people consider mediocre, the teams that they should beat. I do like when the D-backs take care of business there like they did tonight against the Kansas City Royals. And the D-backs, you know, finish the year strong, then maybe Torrey Lavello could bottle up some of that momentum and sell it as a leverage point as to why he should be kept. Because I think his biggest selling point, or excuse me, maybe his second biggest selling point is continuity, continuity, continuity. I always struggle to say that word continuity i always have to like say it in my head before i say it out loud because out loud when i say it before thinking about it it always comes out weird like the first attempt at me saying it today but continuity in team chemistry i think are lavello's biggest selling points or excuse me second biggest selling points if this team um continues to produce in the second half of the season because this team continues to impress in the second half of the season and then maybe he could convince the front office that he's just giving them a glimpse into the future of next year because that's going to be super important if he wants to stick around. How do you finish this year? Can you convince the front office what happened at the end of this year could be carried into next year? That's going to be a big selling point for Toy Lovello if he wants to stay for next season. But speaking of the future of next year and the future of the D-backs, the other biggest selling point as to whether Toy Lovello could stay or not is whether or not the young players develop and they look really good in the second half of the season. Because so far, players like Jake McCarthy, Stone Garrett, Josh Rojas look really good in the second half of the season. I mean, we've talked about Jake McCarthy a lot on this podcast recently because he's just been killing it in the month of August. Stone Garrett as well, so has Josh Rojas. So I believe the second biggest selling point for 
Toy Lovello is team continuity and team chemistry. But I believe the biggest selling point as to why he should be brought back next season in terms of Toy Lovello's perspective is he makes the case that you look at the second half, you look at all those young players, and you look at how they're being developed, how they're being treated, and you're seeing how they progress as the season goes on, like the Jake McCarthy, Stone Garrett, and Josh Rojas. I think that would be the other selling point for Toy Lovello. I can keep the momentum I built at the end of the second half and continue that into next season, along with the development that we saw with the players. Those would be two pretty big selling points for Toy Lovello if that was to happen. But they're just... I just don't really believe, personally, this is where I give my take, I just don't really believe in Toy Lovello as a player development manager overall because you just look at some of the players that Toy Lovello have. I mean, it's not like Dalton Varsha and Carson Kelly have exactly taken the next leap like we've hoped. Like, I still believe Dalton Varsha could be an all-star level outfielder. Still believe Carson Kelly could be, you know, a slugging catcher, potentially an all-star. But do I believe those guys can hit their ceiling under Toy Lovello? I'm not too sure about that. Players like Alec Thomas have gotten worse offensively. And it's just being used so sporadically throughout the lineup. Like how many times have we complained as D-backs fans on Twitter, on this podcast, like stop batting Alec Thomas seventh, I believe. I would have to look at the numbers really quickly. But I believe Alec Thomas, if you look at his splits, he's actually a better um, position player when he's batting ahead in the lineup, like near the top of the lineup as opposed to near the bottom of the lineup. I'm going to pull it up right here. Alec Thomas, when he's batting second in 32 games, the most games of any position in the lineup he's batted this year, 258 average, 704 OPS. Nothing great, right? Nothing elite. But you just compare it to when he's batting seventh, the second most times in the lineup he bats, 24 games batting seventh, 191 average, 574 OPS. So he has been batting second, but he's been way better than batting seventh. And I just don't like the uh, the philosophy of sitting down or moving your better, younger players down in the lineup just because of the splits. Like, that's my biggest issue with Toy Lovello. He, care, he just cares too much about the splits, like the Davinskys of the world, the Hummels, the Luplos. Like, I do not care about those play- people. Those guys should not be in the lineup or out the bullpen just because of a split or a metric, just because Luplo you know, historically kills left-handed pitching, he should be in the lineup against a left-handed pitcher. Well, most times that should be true, but it shouldn't be every time. It shouldn't be every time there's a lefty on the mound, automatically Luplo's in the lineup, especially when Luplo's batting like 165. Like, you got to add some context. It's not just Luplo kills left-handed pitching. Like, what is he actually doing overall on the season? What are other players in the lineup doing against left-handed pitching? Are there left-handed batters? actually on a hot streak against against left-handed pitching. Like, I think all that stuff matters and all that plays into development. And the way Toy Lovello um, implements his lineups and implements those young players in those lineups, I just do not like it. I'm not a huge fan of it. I think it's hard for those players in Toy Lovello's um, lineups to progress and, and succeed because – You just don't know how much playing time you're getting day to day. You don't know what your role is day to day. And I think that's tough on a young guy. And when I just look at the history of young guys under Toy Lovello, like who under Toy Lovello has really popped? I mean, think about all the players from the Zach Granke trade. You could say Rojas has popped, but Berskakis, Corbin Martin, Seth Beer. No, you look at that Paul Goldschmidt trade, Luke Weaver, Paul Goldschmidt, or Luke Weaver, Carson Kelly, 2019, look great. Since then, Luke Weaver's not even on the team anymore. Carson Kelly's in the midst of maybe his worst season offensively ever. Robbie Ray, you look at where he started versus how he finished. Then all of a sudden, he leaves and turns into a Cy Young ace. And then Kevin Ginkle, someone that I thought could be the close of the future back in 2019. And it's like, now, this guy probably shouldn't even be on the major league level. So personally, I've seen enough from Toy Lavello from Toy Lovello's development of players or lack thereof, but maybe he can still save his job with good play from the team and youngsters down the stretch. But for me, it's probably going to be a no-go on on Toy Lovello next season.